Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Aristotle postulated that both chicken and egg were essential properties of the universe, extending infinitely back in time. Plutarch argued that the question pointed to the bigger question of whether the universe had a beginning. And here we find ourselves in need of help from the world's greatest thinkers to settle this issue once and for all. You might imagine that evolution explains life, but it doesn't. And scientists remain perplexed as to how and where life emerged. Are we simply the result of a fluke event? One chemical reaction billions of years ago? Are we right to turn to the biologists to tell us, or does the issue in fact lie deeper? So to help us unpack this awesome uh, debate, basically, and conversation, we have three wonderful panelists. We have Sarah Walker, who is a theoretical physicist turned astrobiologist. She's currently the deputy director of the Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, where she is most interested in whether or not there are laws of life that could universally describe life here on Earth and also other planets. We also are joined by Nick Lane, who is a professor of evolutionary biochemistry at University College London. His research focuses on the way that energy flows, has shaped evolution over four billion years. He is the author of four acclaimed books on evolutionary biochemistry, which have sold more than 500,000 copies worldwide. And last, but by no means least at all, we, uh, we are joined by uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, who is the Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. His research centres on philosophy of mind and philosophy of science, particularly as those fields relate to evolutionary biology and cognitive science. He's a prolific author and has written well over a dozen books, including the bestsellers Consciousness Explained and Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. So, can we see how we might put together a credible origin, uh, sorry, a credible theory on the origin of life? And does it answer the question about the chicken and the egg, importantly? Let's, let's start with Nick, why not? Nick, you're up. Okay, yes, so. all right. Um, so I, I, I don't really understand the question of the chicken and the egg, I have to say. Um, I think biology itself answered that long ago uh, in so far as, eggs go right back to single-celled uh, organisms, not the chicken's egg, but the, the idea of an egg of two sexes and so on. And that really encapsulates the idea of evolutionary change over time um, and, and, and how things can evolve. Uh, and, and I would, you, 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 you kind of slightly dismissed biology uh, as, as a question of the origin of life uh, in your introduction. Strangely, it seems to me, the biologists have been the group who have had less to say about the origin of life. I would say as a field, it's been dominated by chemists over the last 50 or 60 years. It's a question that goes right across science, of course, or pretty much every discipline you can think of plays a major role in trying to understand the origin of life. But um, it's not a single reaction. It's a tremendously long <laughs> uh, distance from prebiotic chemistry, from the simplest stirrings of chemistry to a bacterial cell with, with uh, molecular machines and genes and so on. And so, you know, we still need to understand that long continuum with the same kind of reasoning that uh, answers the chicken and the egg question, which is to say, how does one thing lead to another? How does it change? How does it evolve over time? I actually do think we have a credible theory already for the <coughs> life. Maybe theory is too strong a word for it. I think we have a, a, lot, of, a lot of hypotheses. Uh, I personally think that I can probably get my head around how things happened, but what's lacking is strong evidence for that. And so it doesn't become a scientific theory until we've a, we're able to say, okay, this step leads to this step and we do the entire continuum and we prove in the lab that each step can work and then we have a credible theory. It doesn't prove that's how life started, but it proves we can understand how a sterile planet can give rise to life. So I think we can answer it already in principle, if not in practice. Brilliant. Well, thanks for that, Nick. I mean, Dan, what, what are your thoughts? Can we, can we put together a credible theory? Uh, yes, we can. Um, 
uh, it, it's actually not the philosopher's job to come up with these theories. It's a, it's a job for science. And right now there's, a, it's a, there's an embarrassment of riches. We have more hypotheses out there than, than, than we can even test at the moment. Um, and as Nick said, it, from prebiotic chemistry to actual reproducing simple organisms, that, that's a long stretch. And we, every, every year, every month, uh, pieces of how it must have gone or might have gone uh, get clearer. Uh, what fascinates me about it is that if you, I as an outsider, as a philosopher reading this work, I'm delighted to see the extent to which people not only admit that life is machinery, they use the word <laughs> machine, they describe ribosomes and, and mitochondria as these wonderful machines. They are. As I like to say, we're robots made of robots made of robots <laughs> made of robots. And, and the reason it's been only recently, I think, that uh, people have been able to make real progress on these questions is thanks to 20th century pioneers, we now have disciplined ways of thinking about machines with billions or trillions of parts. And Descartes couldn't think that thought. Uh, Aristotle couldn't think that thought. Now we are unleashed mm -hmm. to imagine a machine with a trillion working parts and we can do it with some, with some discipline. And that's where, that's where the action is. Sarah, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on this, on this question? I think most of the issue is that we've been really focused on trying to understand what the definition of life is that we're trying to solve. And I think that's a big part of the problem that really hasn't entered into considerations about these very hypotheses. They're not really, they're making statements about some aspects of life, but not encompassing in the way that Nick was saying of like the origin and all of evolution of life. Um, and so when I think about this problem, I think of what level of description is a theory of life going to be um, and what level of explanation are we asking for? Um, and just to give sort of analogy, because um, my background's in physics, I think of sort of current frameworks for thinking about life sort of like at the epicycle phase of development of understanding gravity. So like several thousand years ago, you know, we had predictive and descriptive models that were adequate for the time and adequate for the observations that we could take. And it took, you know, 1500 years for um, physics to emerge as a discipline and, and Galileo and Newton to actually unify terrestrial and celestial motion and realize that there was an underlying explanation that we call gravity for those motions. And then Einstein to actually realize that the properties of gravity um, were derived from from the curvature of space time. And, um, you know, this, from this very different phenomena about the physics of light, right? So, um, so I'm using this as an analogy for what we need to do in talking about life, because I think the magnitude of the problem is actually much deeper in terms of our descriptions of the physical world and how we understand it than people give it credit for. And most of the time when I hear discussions about origins of life, they're kind of in the epicycle phase. And we're not asking these deeper questions about why is it our current physics theories can't account for all of the richness that we see in life and they're not explanatory of what we see in life. It doesn't mean those theories are wrong. They're right in the domains they were developed for, but it might be that we need new physical principles and new laws of nature to actually describe life. And just as an example, in reference to the chicken and egg problem, there is a chicken and egg problem in physics, which is that in the time of Newton, when he came up with the idea of physics that, that most of physics is built on now, he built physics thinking that there were dynamical laws that existed outside of the universe and outside of time, and they were immutable. And that requires an initial state for the universe that you have to specify or any dynamical system you wanna study. In biology, that gets really tangled because we have this kind of effect in living systems where it looks like the rules depend on the systems that exist. They depend on the actual things that are there. So um, it's a very different kind of system. And in some way, you could think about the law depending on the state. Um, and so they're actually not 
not separable. Um, and this is sort of one of the issues, the chicken and the egg. Um, in physics, we have laws and states. In biology, they're actually the same thing. I specify my dynamics as a, a, a living system. I can move about and I have, you know, causal efficacy and things. So, um, so I think really the, the underlying issue is what kind of explanatory theory do we need to account for life and how much of our current understanding is going to be reinvented by coming up with this theory and really thinking about life as a real phenomenon that exists in the universe and needs explanation. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's a really great overview to, to this problem the three of you have given me. Um, so I want to move on to the sort of first theme of this debate and I kind of reel it a little bit back, I guess. Um, and, you know, before we, we get into the sort of details of how life originated, it would, you know, I think we would do really well to clarify, you know, what is what actually is this thing called life that we're trying to investigate in the first place, you know, and what makes it so interesting. So, you know, yeah, Nick, what are your thoughts on that? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.